I preach this morning in the name of God, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So we continue today with our sermon series for this new year of 2020 called The Focus on Faith. Y'all asked, did you hear that? Y'all asked a lot of real questions, and we do our best to provide uh, thoughtful answers. And so far we've looked at your questions about God and His nature, about God and the sacraments, about our own faith and faithfulness. But today we shift our focus from God and ourselves to the people around us, to the people in our lives who don't know God, who don't know Jesus, who don't love him, who don't worship him, and how we are to live with him. And so I'm calling this sermon today, Does Finding Jesus Mean Losing My Friends? And that comes from a question that one of you submitted online. And the question is this. Can you have friends who are non-believers? Can you have friends who are non-believers? Of course you can. And we hope that you do. Because that's the only way that the church will grow. You see, Christianity is a missionary religion. We grow by reaching new people with the good news of Jesus Christ. And so we are counting on you to have unbelievers in your life whom we can reach. So not only can you have friends but you should have friends who are non-believers, and we hope that you do. But note here that the, the question continues, can you marry a non-believer? Can you marry a non-believer? Well, you can, but from the earliest days of the church, it has not been recommended. Going all the way back to the year 55, the Apostle Paul wrote the Corinthians, and he said to them, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. You see, marriage yokes, as Paul put it, or as we would put it, marriage hitches husband and wife together for life. And you've got to work together, you've got to pull together to make a marriage work. Well, if one spouse is digging in his heels about going to church, if one spouse is pulling away from God, well, that introduces a tension into the marriage that is really hard to live with, especially once the kids come and it's time to start raising them. So you can marry an unbeliever, but it's, it's not recommended. Faith and marriage run too deep in who we are as a person, and so faith and marriage really ought to run together. Speaking of faith and marriage and love brings up another one of your questions. Someone asked, if God made man love a woman, why are there gays? Well, for the same reason that a husband can love a woman who's not his wife because love can go wrong. Love can go wrong in all kinds of ways, and same-sex attraction is one of them. People can love the wrong things, love of money, love of self, love of fame, love of fortune, love of comfort. People can, run, can love the wrong things. People can even love the right things, but do it in the wrong way. Even love of God can go wrong. People can love God so much, so zealously, so fanatically that they do awful, awful things in God's name. Jesus encountered people like that all the time. He called them Pharisees. Love of God can go wrong. Love of family can go wrong too. Somebody asked, how does God define idolatry? For example, I think about the welfare of my children all the time. I worry about them constantly. I would do almost anything to help and support them. Is this idolatry in the eyes of the Lord? Well, it can be. It is good and right to love your family. It is good and right to support your family. It is good and right to sacrifice for your family. And yet love for your family can be emotionally unhealthy. It can become emotionally unhealthy. It can become spiritually idolatrous. Love can go wrong in all kinds of ways. And same-sex attraction is one of them. Now, that's not to deny the emotional reality or even the genuine bind of that love. Two men or two women may truly, genuinely, deeply love each other and yet still be wrong. That love is still wrong. It's still a sin. And that brings us to a related question somebody asked. How do we respond to loved ones in a gay lifestyle? Well, the same way that you would respond to anybody else, with love. 
treating them with respect, treating them with dignity, doing the right thing by them, doing the right thing for them, and that certainly means by not bearing false witness against them through gossip, through slander, through crude or through snide remarks. Jesus commands us to do unto others as we would have them do unto you. Jesus commands us to love our neighbor as ourselves, and that certainly goes for your closest neighbor, the people who are nearest and dearest to your heart, your loved ones in your family, even if their love has gone wrong, still, you love them because they're your family. Related question, how to share the gospel in a loving way to anyone including those with abnormal sexual urges or practices. Well, there's three steps in sharing the gospel. And the first, the first step is to know what the gospel is. And the gospel is the good news about Jesus Christ. It's the good news of Jesus Christ, who is the creator incarnate, who is God in the flesh, who for us and for our salvation came down from heaven and was born as one of us who died on the cross to take away our sin, who rose from the dead to give us life, and who now lives to give eternal life and the forgiveness of sins to everyone and to anyone who turns to him and trusts in him and asks for it. That's the gospel. It's the good news of God in Jesus Christ. It's the first thing you know. First is know what the gospel is. The second is know what difference the gospel has made in your life. How has trusting in Jesus, how has turning to Jesus, how has following Jesus, how has living with Jesus made your life better? You need to know that and be ready to tell people about it, be ready to share it. And then third, be aware that the gospel is often heard as bad news before it becomes good. The gospel the good news about Jesus Christ, crucified and risen from the dead, convicts us of our sin. It says to us, you are not all right. You are not whole. You are not healthy. You cannot help yourself. You cannot change yourself. You are a sinner, and you need to repent. And people do not like to hear that. So how do I get a family member, in this case a son, to turn his life to God without forcing him and possibly turning him away from God forever? You can't. You can't get your son to turn to God. Only the Holy Spirit can get your son to turn to God. But what you can do is pray that the Holy Spirit will. Love your son. No matter what he has done, no matter how he has frustrated you or broken your heart or disappointed you, love your son because he is your son. Love your son and pray for your son. Pray that God will move in his life. Pray that God will move in his heart. Pray that God will break through the hardness of his heart. Pray that God will drop the scales from his eyes. Pray that God will give him faith to turn to Jesus Christ and be saved. Love your son, pray for your son, and when the opportunity comes, pray with your son. Because you would be amazed by the impact that praying with people who don't know God, by praying with them, can have upon their lives. Because whenever you pray for someone in the name of Jesus Christ, you invite Jesus to come and be present in that person's life in that moment, and he will. He will. I have seen it more times than I can count. Love your son. Pray for your son. Pray with your son. But you cannot save him. Only Jesus can. You cannot turn him to Jesus. Only the Holy Spirit can. But it happens. The Holy Spirit intercedes in people's lives and turns them around, and I stand before you today as living proof that it happens. And whenever it happens, it is always a miracle, because just like your son, none of us by nature want to turn to Jesus and be saved. 
How do we live as Christians in a world that has turned away from God? Well, the same way that Christians have always lived because this world has always been turned away from God, going back almost to the very beginning. When our first parents, Adam and Eve, freely chose, freely chose to love themselves rather than God, ever since that moment, our ability to love has been broken. By our fallen nature, by default, we do not love the right things, we do not love the right ways, and we certainly do not love him. And yet he loves us. Still God loves us with a fierce love that will not let us go. Still God loves us with a jealous love that puts uncompromising and exclusive claims upon our lives. Either Jesus is Lord and Redeemer, or he's not. Either Jesus is the Savior in the King, or he's not. Either Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through him, or he's not, and he's wrong. There is no middle ground when it comes to Jesus. No matter how badly some people may hope to find it. How do we deal with Christian friends who uplift lifestyles that the Bible denounces? Have patience with them? Have sympathy for what they're going through? Understand the kind of pressures that they are under because we are all like them to one extent or another. I mean, we all want to fit in with a crowd. We all want to go along and get along. No one wants to stand out or be put upon the spot. And we are all tempted, we are all tempted to compromise and water down what the Bible says is wrong, especially when the world around us says it's right. But there can be no compromise. Either God's word is true or it's not. Either Jesus is the Savior from sin and the Lord of the universe or he's not. Why do some people hate Jesus? Because Jesus shows us who we really are. We are not all right. We are not in control. We are not God. He is. We are lost. Our world is lost and depraved and hostile to God, and our culture is lost. Christians lost the culture war. We no longer set the tone or call the shots for our culture. That high ground has been seized by the media, by academia, by entertainment, by the courts, by people who do not believe in God and reject God's claims upon them, and they are relentlessly bombarding those of us who do. We are in the midst of a war, and you have to decide which side you're on, what you are going to do, and whom you are going to believe. Either God is real, and he defines reality, Fact from fiction, true from wrong, true from false. Or God is not real. He's just make-believe. And we define reality. Each and every one of us for him or herself. And in this particular cultural moment that we're in, reality always comes back to sex. Are unborn babies human? Can a man be a woman? Is there any biological connection to sex? For believers, these answers are obvious from God's word and from creation. Of course unborn babies are human. I mean, what else are they going to be? Dogs? No, a man can't be a woman. Just take a look. And yes, there's a biological connection to sex. Otherwise, the parts don't fit. For believers, these questions are settled, obvious facts. But for the world, they are all open-ended opinions. And the world would say, an unborn child is a human being when I decide it's a human being. 
And that's before birth in all 50 states and even after birth in the state of New York. A man can be a woman, or a man, or nothing, or something in between. A person is whatever a person says that person is at the moment that the person says it. That's what they is. And I can do whatever I want with whomever I want, whenever I want, and soon enough with whatever I want, whether machine or animal, because there is no biological connection to sex. It's all about me and my pleasure. There is no possible compromise between these. Who defines reality? God for us all, or each individual for him or herself. There is no possible compromise between them. And you have to decide for yourself which side you're on. But know this. If you decide against the world, you will be punished. How do we respond to being required to recognize co-workers and students as transgender? And note well the way the question is even asked. It doesn't say, how do we respond to uh, accepting and living with and tolerating and learning to work with co-workers and students who are transgender? No, it says, how do we respond to being required to recognize co-workers and students who are transgendered, conform to the lie or you will be punished by HR. That's the world we live in today. That's the world we live in today. And how do we confront sin, share Christ, and maintain loving relationships in the face of such darkness? The way Christians always have. By God's grace and by stalwart faith. As we heard the apostles say in our lesson today, by holding fast, by holding fast to the word of life and by living as children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you shine like stars in the night. Because by nature you are no different from them, but by grace you have been redeemed. You once were lost, but now you are found. You once were blind, but now you see. God has called you out of the darkness, and now God commands you to shine your light into the darkness. And will you shine your light for Jesus? Will you stand up and stand out for Jesus? Or will you hide your light under a bushel basket, compromise with the darkness, and conform to the lie? Does finding Jesus mean losing my friends? It shouldn't have to. But unfortunately, in this day and age, it probably does. Finding Jesus probably does mean losing friends, losing family members, who will reject you and scorn you and mock you and push you away because of your faith in Jesus Christ. The world will not compromise on this, and the world will not give up. It is not going to get any easier, people. You will be made to conform, or you will be made to hurt. You have to decide for yourself where you stand. But as for me, I made my decision 20 years ago. Back in the year 2000, when I was going through my third and final interview as a pastoral candidate for the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, I was going through my third and final interview, and the church officials from the New England Synod asked me a question as part of that interview. They said, Pastor, let's imagine you have a gay couple in your church, and they asked to be married in your church. Would you marry them? I said, no, I would not. The church officials kept me in that room for five hours trying to get me to change my answer. And I would not. Finally, begrudgingly, they approved me as a Lutheran pastor. 
but then they sent me off to serve my first church in North Dakota. (laughs) I saw back then, I saw back then where the so-called tolerance agenda was headed. I would not back then, and I am not about to back down now, because if the church should fall, if the church should compromise, what hope is there for our nation? You need to know where I stand, that I stand on God's word, and I am not moving. You need to decide for yourself where you stand too. Does finding Jesus mean losing my friends? It shouldn't have to. But unfortunately, it probably does. Are you willing to lose your friends, to lose your family members, to lose your name, to lose your good reputation, to lose your comfort, to find Jesus Christ? Amen. Let us pray. Lord God Almighty, your word is truth, and your word cuts us like a two-edged sword. Lord, there are many things that your word shows us that we do not like about ourselves or the situations that we're in. But God, your word is truth, and though it cuts us, yet it calls us back to you that we might be healed and made whole again. Lord God, we thank you that by your grace, by the power of your Holy Spirit, Lord, you have given us faith to turn to you and believe in you and have life in your name. Thank you, Jesus, for what you have done for us. And now, Jesus, we pray. God, we pray for those people in our lives, those people whom we name right now, those people, Lord, who have wandered away from you and off into sin. Lord God Almighty, we pray that you would move in their life and turn them back to you, that they might be with you forever. And God, give us grace, give us courage, give us strength to stand and bear witness to you in this time. For we ask this, Jesus, in your holy name. Amen. Amen. Amen.